In the Nye Cancer Institute at OHSU in Portland, Oregon, researchers have built a first-of-its-kind platform designed to find combinations of drugs that can stop tumors before they adapt and become drug-resistant. In-depth tracking of each patient's cancer over time makes it possible to adjust targeted drug com combinations to stay ahead of cancer's ability to evolve. This platform is called SMMART, I guess SMART, uh, Serial Measurements of Molecular and Architectural Responses to Therapy. Dr. Mills is the director of the Precision Oncology and director of the SMART Trials, associate director, ad intern for clinical research, and holds the Wayne and Julie Drinker Endowed Chair in Precision Oncology in the Knight Cancer Institute. In these roles, he is responsible for the implementation of the integrated program of tumor analysis, decision making and implementation of novel, novel uh, precision oncology trials. The key goal will to be use serial terminal or serial tumor and liquid biopsies to evaluate and target adaptive responses in real time to interdict cancer evolution. The overarching goal is to perform deep molecular analysis of each patient and to let the patient teach them what is important. Dr. Mills will take a major role in the mentoring, support, and career development of young scientists, and in particular, physician scientists at Knight Institute. You're in for a real treat. Gordon will speak to us. And by the way, he is the husband of Chris Mills, who was sitting on the front row right up here with Judy. Lift your hand, Chris Mills, one of our choir members. So Gordon, talk to us. Thank you. Thank you very much for that introduction. I uh, probably don't need to give the talk. <laughs> OK, so I'm going to tell you a lot about what we're doing at the Knight Cancer Institute. I'm going to talk about my program, a little bit about cancer. Um, there's not many, it's, it's not full, so please feel free to interrupt with questions. If I'm going too fast, too slow, just stop me. And I was asked to put in a little bit about COVID-19 at the end if uh, we have time. So this is the view out my window when I arrived. Uh, not my view now, I got the other side of the building. <laughs> I'll show you the picture of the guy who took the other side in a moment. <laughs> but anyway, so who am I? Why am I here? I'm actually an obstetrician gynecologist. I'm a Canadian. My training is in immunology, biochemistry, medicine. I worked at the MD Anderson Cancer Center for 24 years. The MD Anderson Cancer Center is the largest and top-ranked cancer center in the U.S. and I have lots of titles. One of the big things that I've done is been a proponent for changing the way in which we think about doing science. When I started, it was one professor, one student, one technician, and that's all you worked with. It's clear now as we begin to understand the complexity of cancer, the complexity of biology, it's going to take teams. And we have to figure out how to build teams, manage teams, keep teams going, support teams. I actually think that, that I probably didn't turn it on, did I? I also probably don't need to turn it on. <laughs> Sorry. And, uh, and of course, uh, as we were just introduced, the most important thing is I'm owned by that young lady in the, the second row there who sings in your choir. So I've been asked many times why I came to the Night Cancer Institute. And it really is a switch from one of the largest cancer centers in the world to instead what is a young, flexible, growing cancer center that is dedicated to being better. And that really is an important thing. Once you get too big, you get too bureaucratic, and you can't do anything. The night is really going to make a difference. Brian Drucker, the head of the cancer center, is really committed to making a difference for patients. I will say that most cancer centers right now are so fully focused on the bottom line. We have to make sure that we can afford to do the work we do, but the goal at the night is to help people and really change the way in which we treat patients. You heard a little bit about that a moment ago. 
There's also a great group of outstanding scientists that I'm able to work with. And there's a long history that I'll show you in a little moment in this area of precision oncology uh, that I'm going to talk about in this smart analytics program that I have. However, this was part of the recruiting. <laughs> This is two and a half hours or two hours from my home. That's the Deschutes. That's a, a nice little Idaho steelhead that is released to swim around a little further. A uh, different trip also with my son and daughter-in-law. That is the biggest smile I have ever seen on my daughter-in-law's face. My son has never smiled in his life. Uh, this particular trip, since uh, she caught five and he caught none, there were no smiles in that. So, what are we going to talk about today? One of the things we don't do very well as scientists is tell you where we are in terms of cancer and cancer care. And so, I want to talk about the evolution since 1953. It's a good date, that was when I was born. We need to start somewhere. The five year survival for patients with cancer at that time was about 30%. 1971 was the National Cancer Act the five-year survival had improved to 50%. That's not cure rates, that's that you will live five years with your cancer. What was striking though in the 1990s was the first time that the mortality rate for cancer actually started to decline. And that means that for 100,000 people, fewer people died of cancer in the 90s than in the 80s. Come back to why we don't think that in a moment. 2000, well, 2001, there were about 10 million cancer survivors in the United States. 2003, the absolute death rate declined, meaning no correction for number of people or anything else. Fewer people died of cancer that year than the year before. The change from there has been remarkable. And so I'm going to ask the question, how many of you would believe without me standing here, that the death rate from cancer has dropped remarkably since the 1990s. Well, that's pretty good. And I think one of the reasons, and I'll use my age, that we don't think that is cancer is a disease of aging, and as we get older, we see it affect more and more of our friends and family. And we don't see the people that we cure. We see the people that don't do too well. So I don't think we've done a very good job of getting the message out. My major area of research is in women's cancers, breast, uterus, ovary. And the data here is remarkable. In 2010, the breast cancer death rate started to drop at 2% per year and continues compound interest. These are changes that I haven't dreamed of. I'm not going to show you pictures, but I have lots of pictures I could show you of people who are out five and 10 years now who wouldn't have lived six months, five years ago. Breast cancer survivors are continuing to go up, and the five-year survival rate is now two-thirds. This is a massive change. That's more than doubling from when I started that. 2016 was the 21st Century Cures Act, which finally began to put a little more money back into the system. We still are way behind where we were in the 2000s. The cancer death rate has declined by 30%. That's pretty remarkable in just that period of time. And the biggest drop ever, that's the last year we have accurate data, is 2017 of 2.2%. <clears throat> These are remarkable. Now, we're making real progress. We're not quite where we want to be. But I'm going to show you just some pictures of those. And I apologize, scientists always have lots of diagrams and, and pictures. But basically, if we look at what's happening out here, this is 2000, and we look at the death rates, they really are dropping male, female, female mortality. I'll show you a little bit about why in just a moment. Now, this is really looking at this on the male and female side in very specific diseases. And the ugly one here, of course, over time, is this red one here, which is lung cancer, almost unheard of in the 1900s peaked in males at about 1990 and is dropping precipitously. You'll notice that women started to smoke later, but most of them haven't stopped as early. 
And this is a major problem. So it's still a concern in women. Uh, we have other things that we just don't understand. We sometimes see cancers whopping amount, there's pancreas, melanoma, but we see one here called stomach that has just been dropping like a rocket since the 1900s. We have no idea why. So there are many things that we've understood, we haven't worked all of them out. So why aren't we making more progress? We've made great progress, but why not more? Well, first, there are many types of cancer. In reality, we now know that every person's cancer is different from every other person's cancer. And that means we can't treat every person the same way. And that's very much what I'm going to try and talk about tonight, which is personalized cancer care, uh, personalized therapy, precision oncology, all variations of the same word. Our other problem is that we frequently detect cancers late. Once they spread massively, our drugs and our approaches are less effective than if we find it early. Early detection, though, is really, really hard. And although the lifetime risk of developing cancer in, in men and women is one in two or one in three, it's at any one time the chance that an individual will have cancer is like finding a needle in a haystack. One in 10,000 women in the age group that we have here will have ovarian cancer. Think of trying to figure that out in this veil of hay of one person. And so it is very, very hard, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. The other is, is that cancer is very different from normal cells. They derive from normal cells. They just stop behaving. Cells have to be social. They have to behave properly, they have to interact with each other, and it's when one cell becomes a rogue and stops interacting with the others. And we have people who are like that. <laughs> and they just take over. <clears throat> but they're not all that different. And so sort of the statement we frequently make is it's really easy to cure cancer. Keeping the patient alive when you do that is hard. Because there's not much difference between the cancer cells and the normal cells. And we're trying to deal with that. And that has been a real challenge. The other is that we have drugs that work. Unfortunately, they work shorter than we would like. And we have to understand resistance, as was introduced. And I will point out that the problem down at the bottom, just as we have an understanding of cancer at a level we wouldn't have dreamed of 10 and 15 years ago, funding for cancer research with the current government is in the pits. We're actually at minus 30% in terms of inflation from the 2000. So it's a chance to make a difference. Everything we do helps. Well, what can we do to decrease our risk of cancer? Well, the first one is lifestyle. Over 50%, in some estimates, in terms of not cause, but association, go as high as 70%. Cigarette smoke, obesity, lack of exercise. Three things that are not all that hard to do in theory, very hard in practice. Cancer screening works in some diseases. Breast, colon, cervix, we have changed the behavior of those diseases. Cervix cancer, when I started training, was one of the most common cancers we have. We rarely see a case now because of cancer screening. Finally, they're early at a completely terminal stage. And also knowing their own risk. Do you have a family history? Could there be a genetic reason why you are at greater risk and you need more screening, or you might need genetic counsel? This was all taken to Phil Knight about five years ago, and Phil Knight stepped up and said, there really is no higher calling than curing cancer, and unlike many of us, he put his money where his mouth was. A $500 million matching to take forward a cancer early detection and prevention program. And you'll know that's not the program I lead, and so I'm going to tell you a little bit about that program first, and that's what some of those brochures about. But I will be talking for my colleague, Sadek Gesser. He heads the early detection program. I lead the program that treats cancers once they are more advanced. The reason these overlapping circles are here is really to say that our two programs are completely intertwined, we work very well together, we socialize together, this wife is an absolute delight, and so we have built a program going from 
understanding how cancer starts, detecting it early, preventing it, learning which cancers could be lethal. If we find something early and it's not going to harm you, why do anything about it? And then how to manage those cancers. And these numbers are real. If we look at when we find cancers early or late, on the left-hand side is what happens in terms of finding cancers at an early stage. Our cure rates for prostate cancer, if we find it early, approach 100%. We find it late, we're down to 28%. Find ovarian cancer early, 92%. 27% is late. Breast cancer, 99%. The numbers I was telling you about cure rate in early breast cancer now, about three years ago, 24% if it's really late. So we want to discover cancer early. And one of the things that I brought today is about a program that we've just started that we think has a real hope to change the way in which we find cancer. It's a blood test. We take a small amount of blood. Most cancers right now are not screened for. We can't. We don't have ways to do it. Most of our tests are looking for one cancer. But you're not at risk for one cancer. You're at risk for many types of cancer. I do tests for ovarian cancer and you develop breast cancer and didn't help. And so we have to do something that goes beyond that. And we also have a worry about false positives. We tell somebody that they have cancer and they don't, that's absolutely horrible. And even more, if we find cancers that would not harm the individual, would not kill them, that's even worse because we treat them. Men who die of other diseases, 17% of prostate cancer. It did not kill them, it did not harm them, and it would never have killed them. If we had diagnosed it, we would have done a horrible operation and treatment for that individual. We have to know which are the active indolent versus indolent cancers. Breast cancer, and I actually did this because someone told me that a different story, and I actually looked. In very large studies, 8% of women will die with a breast cancer in place that never affected them in their life. We don't want to find those. We have to find the ones that will harm people and do something about it. Now, we know that cancer is a disease of genes and genetic changes. Through the genes that we have, you create everything in the body. Your hair color, your eye color is all encoded in your genes. Cancer has changes in the genes. That's how it happens, that's how it works. And we need to be able to detect those changes very, very early if we're going to do early detection. And it turns out that an absolutely surprising piece of data, I would never have believed it, is that DNA from cancers, even when they're that big compared to this big fat belly, when they're that big can be found in the bloodstream. And if we can look at those in a very sensitive manner, we have the potential to make this work. Working with a company called Braille, there's been a test that can not only detect cancer, but tell you where it is almost all of the time. 93% of the time, you take a blood test, we'll say you do or don't have, or do have cancer, but we're still not ready to say you don't. And where it is, so we can do something about it. I just handed out to many of you what's called the Pathfinder trial. We are currently enrolling 6,200 6, patients, individuals who are over 50 years old, we're looking for two-thirds of people who have high risk by family history of smoking, a third who don't, so we can see how the test works. It's called Pathfinder. It's in the brochures, and if not, just find Chris, and she'll get you the information about how to get there. Now, I want to switch over to this other question, which is personalized medicine. What is it that I do in our program? Well, currently, when we treat cancer, it's really historical. It's trial and error. We have been treating patients with types of cancer the same way for 20, 30, 40 years, and we've done better, but we're not where we need to be. And I already told you that every person's cancer is different. So if we treat everyone the same, that's not going to work. What we really need to do is have the right treatment for the right person at the right time. And we need to look at the idea of what happens when we use one size fits all. That means some patients are going to benefit, some patients are going to have no benefit whatsoever, but they're actually harmed because we're not getting them to the right treatment. And for some patients, this treatment is going to be toxic. They'll make them sick. 
with no benefit. So that's not an acceptable way to do it. So our whole program is based around the idea that if we can develop personalized diagnostics, so I can tell who's going to benefit from that drug, or that drug, or we'll be sick with that drug, we can really change, even without new drugs and new ideas, where we go. And so the idea here is to personalize to each of you the therapy that we would use, the cancer that you have, the therapy that we would use, and improve our outcomes. To show you the same slide, we use the genes as the idea initially to detect cancer early. But if cancer is a disease of genes, we need to drug those changes. If we can figure out what is specific about one person's cancer versus another, we can make a difference. We can go from the relatively blunt instruments that we've used for the last generation of radiation and chemotherapy to really starting to hone in on the specific events in each cancer and target those with small molecules, with drugs, with immunotherapy, by changing the nutrition that the cancer gets compared to normal cells and start to make a difference. Can we capitalize on this incredible information trove we've developed? I told you that the Knight Cancer Institute has had a long history in doing this. I think you may recognize this picture. By the way, this is with permission, no HIPAA problems. The Knight Cancer Institute, with Brian Drucker, developed and implemented a therapy for a type of leukemia called chronic myelogenous leukemia. I hate to admit, at the time that Brian developed the cure and moved it forward, I was working on this, actually a little before he was. But over half of the patients now with chronic myelogenous leukemia are cured, meaning they can stop their therapy. The remainder stay on therapy for life, and I'll show you what that means in a moment. But the really neat thing here was Judy was number nine on the trial. The first earliest attempt to see if this drug might work. And the goal that we have at the night is to make sure we identify and develop the next Gleevec and the next one and the next one, and make sure that the people of Oregon have access to these drugs. Now, this is a little bit of a complicated slide. I'm going to walk you through it because this is perhaps one of the most exciting things I've seen. And I have some stories, although not nearly as nice as the one we heard before me, of days when we saw changes in how cancer behaved and what we were able to do. Now, this is Sweden. And Sweden is a place where you follow everyone from birth to death. And given the number of birth that you have for the rest of your life, and the average person moves less than 50 miles in their whole lifespan. So we can track people from birth to death. When Brian Gruger, I'll use males, so I'm actually going to use Judy as an example. 1990, Judy was probably in her 50s, and at that point was when she came on the trial. At that time, women would lose 25 years of their lifespan because of this cancer. Take a look at this today. For people who develop chronic myelogenous leukemia today, it used to be a life sentence. Everybody died when I started dealing with it. The lifespan is unchanged from the normal population. By a simple pill that you can take at home with essentially no side effects. Now, other diseases aren't as easy to deal with. We have good therapies, they start, but as we heard, they adapt to therapy. And we all adapt. We have to adapt. It's part of being alive. So I got up at 4 this morning, and it's a little later than I usually get up, and that means I start coffee early. <laughs> Today, I had enough coffee that if you took the caffeine out of that coffee, every cell in my body, or every cell in the tissue culture dish, would be dead. It's nasty. But my body is adapted to survive that. Think of what happens with diesel fumes, things in your food, you have to be able to adapt to stress. Stress of drugs, stress of things. The cancer cells are really smart. They adapt real fast. And our whole goal here is to understand if we have a therapy that starts to work, how does the cell adapt to that therapy and become resistance and stop it? Not only that, but we need to understand that cancer isn't just a bunch of cancer cells that you have all kinds of cells in the whole tumor ecosystem 
and the patient, where we have to deal with all of those pieces together. We focus on the tumor cell for the last 20 years. We need to start looking at everything else. These are pretty pictures. They don't need much in this pictures. But this is what the SMART trial is. We have developed and implemented a suite of technologies that no one else in the world has. Where we can look at a tumor and its environment at a breadth and depth that is unthinkable. It was unthinkable 10 years ago. I actually presented this in a meeting three weeks, three months ago, two months ago now, and several people in the room said, you can't do this. And I said, but we're doing it. And they said, well, we can't even dream of it. It's not fair that we can. <laughs> and I can actually say that I'm comfortable that the team here is doing this when no one else can. I had 170,000 air miles last year. My wife will testify where that took me and when I wasn't here. And I can tell you what everybody else in the world is doing. This team here is unbelievable. And we go from looking at the smallest molecules all the way up to the whole individual to try and understand all of the things that are going on and use that. And so that leads to our concept of SMART. And this is the serial measurement of molecular and architectural responses to therapy. How did the tumor become resistant? It's the whole architecture. It's not just one cell. It's not one molecule. We've got to put it all together and make sense out of it. And we have clinical goals. And the first one is, is to adapt the therapy for every single patient we're working with and treat every patient differently. That sounds easy. It's not as easy to do. And we want to achieve durable control, but there's something else that comes with that. If we're going to have durable control for a long period of time, it has to be tolerable. So we not only work on killing the tumor cells, but also decreasing the challenges and toxicities for the patient, and they're equally as important to us. We have research goals, how tumors become resistant, what can we do about it, how can I identify Mrs. Green, Mrs. White, and Mrs. Brown, and say that's exactly the therapy for you, and tell it's not for someone else. And the other is that we are moving away from taking a piece of tissue. I told you that that DNA gets in the blood. Actually, tumors release all kinds of things in the blood when they're dying or when they're growing. And if we can just analyze those carefully, I'm not going to have to take a piece of tissue. That would be great. We're not there yet, but it's a major goal. And so the whole idea of this is that patients will be part of our program throughout their total care, their whole cancer journey. Start with us, they will continue with us as the tumor evolves. We're going to keep evolving faster than it does. And the idea that that leads to is that we can take a piece of tissue at the beginning when the patient enters, we pick our therapy. If it works, they go out the other end with great results. But if it doesn't, we just go back and do it again and say, Can we learn something new? And I have a patient that is, I guess, one of my better friends right now who when we started this program, it was predicted to live about six weeks, and they're now about three years. And we've constantly changed the therapies that you were evolved, and we're, we're really learning and making a difference. But it's keeping the patient going through the whole thing. What makes us different? Well, I already told you that trial and error makes no sense. We need to get the right person treatment to the right person at the right time, but over time. We've got to be smarter than that tumor. So we have a series of truly innovative trials that are designed to do what I just talked about. We're going to deal with those early changes by which the tumor adapts. We're going to deal with the gene changes that happens over a long time, that the strongest cells, like our immune selection, become real mean and beat up on the other cancer cells in the patient. We have a whole program where we're counteracting early tumor evolution. It's called AMTEC. We take a biopsy early. We then see what the tumor does over two, three, four weeks and add a new drug to make it the drug we were using even better. And we hopefully learn something not only for that patient, but for the next group of patients. Now, I can start to tell you some hints. We've just really begun to scratch the surface here. Basal breast cancer, the ugliest and the meanest breast cancer out there. We don't have much that works. 
We have three of our patients who have had their tumor go away. We can't even find a hint of it. We've got three patients where we've had their tumors go away almost completely, and two more with prolonged stable diseases. In a major trial, I'm lucky to see one. This is really different from what we've seen before. We also want to deal with these when the tumors evolve late. Can we start on drugs? We do the best we can, the tumor eventually becomes resistant, and at that point we're not going to add a new drug, we're going to have to change, but we're going to change in a smart manner. That's a bad one. The idea is, is to again, learn more, and here we have 19 patients that we have enrolled through the program, and of those patients where we were able to identify a target and get the therapies, they live twice as long. Now, I've only been here 18 months. This is pretty good. So where are we going? Well, we now know that people do their best when they stay at home in their support networks. We heard about your support network, the support network that everyone has here in their community, in their church. If we take people out of that environment, say somebody is in bed, and say, you have to come to Portland to this wonderful ivory tower and get this treatment, it'll help you. We're actually not doing the best we can. Because we know if we leave patients in their support network, they're going to do a lot better. Well, what I talked about was the fact that we're helping patients, but we do it by characterize what is going on in their tumor. So we are going to become the Amazon of cancer care. We actually are working with Amazon on this, and, and delivering tissues and organs by drones has happened. And so our goal will be to use wonderful new communication approaches, leave the patient at home, video conference with them and their physician. If we need to have tissue come, great. For a while they're coming because we need to get that to happen, but it's working. I'm actually going to skip that because I did that before, and I'm going to try something. Let's see if this will work. This is what we're trying to do. One day, a man was walking along the beach when he noticed a boy picking up starfish and throwing them into the ocean. Approaching the boy, he asked, Excuse me, but what are you doing? The boy replied, Throwing starfish back into the ocean. The sun is rising and the tide is going out. If I don't throw them back, they'll die. The man laughed to himself and said, But there's too many selfish on this beach. You can't possibly make a difference. After listening politely, the boy bent down, picked up another selfish, and threw it into the ocean. Then turning to the man, he said, I made a difference to that one. So the goal of our team is to make a difference one patient at a time. Uh, this is our support. We get support from a number of sources. Much of this is from philanthropy. Federal government supports dull and boring science. If you can't say I've already done it, you don't get funded. It's doing something like this that is out on the edge to try and make a difference, and I do admit, and do argue it's one patient at a time, is something that we had incredible support from a number of people and a number of granting agencies and a number of foundations. This is based work by a team of over 100 people going from patient advocates through to every possible type of person in terms of running the program. So what I thought we might do, if it's uh, okay with timing, is that I could take a few questions now and then I do have some slides about COVID-19 I was asked to put those together so I can answer questions on that. I am not an epidemiologist, but I do have a fair amount of background and information and actually data that came out of the conference last Friday trying to decide what to do about this. So, anyways, are there other questions, please? There's a lot of oncologists running around Portland. I'm a patient of one of them. Do they know about this stuff? Um, some. Most know not yet. I will have to say something that I thought it was, it's on one of the slides or it should have been and I didn't emphasize. 
Right now, our major pilot project is in breast cancer. And there's all kinds of reasons for that. That's okay, men get breast cancer. Why you, why you ought to see the look on my patients' faces, the men patients, when I say, you're going for a mammogram. Boy, does that change the whole rubric. <laughs> and you can, there's a whole separate set of machines for mammograms in men. So if you're misbehaving, your wife will have some revenge. <laughs> okay. Um, so that's where we're starting. We're just moving into pancreatic cancer with some very interesting studies. Acute myelosis, leukemia, and prostate cancer. The others are going to come over the next probably year or so as we build up the program. Um, I have been told, you know, sort of voluntold, that we will get there soon. So many of the physicians, at least who interact with the uh, Night Cancer Institute, will know about this program. I do spend a lot of time at Legacy and some of the other centers. Providence is has their own programs and they're actually very good. I do talk to the leadership there about this, but I don't think it gets down to their oncologists. Yes? Can, can you work with a person who's already been diagnosed with breast cancer and already had mastectomies and find out whether or not you know, she's still a, a problem? So that Pathfinder study would be perfect for that individual to say if there's something that we need to do. We do do a lot of work with individuals who've had cancer and it's come back and it's spread and we deal with the toughest of the tough that other people are not too happy with. So yes, um, most women, and you saw that curve, 99% with young, with early breast cancer and mastectomy are going to be cured. They don't need me. They need to enjoy their life. But yes, we will help you get to someone that will direct you in the right way. That's part of the program. Is it really expensive? Well, I, I don't know if you're asking the question in terms of expense to you. The insurance companies cover all of it, right? Or almost all of it right now. If you're asking in terms of health care, is it going to be expensive because health care costs are running out of control? We've done a lot of work on trying to understand that. And yes, it's going to be more expensive, but I need to explain why. So the first thing is, is that the cost of the drugs that we use to treat patients today, we use two drugs, and your insurance company is covering it, is $30,000 a month. Okay? That's the cost. Now, we think that all of the tests we do to get you on to the best drug is in less than half of a month's worth of drug cost. The problem is, is if I keep patients alive twice as long, they take drugs for twice as long. And so when we worked out the fact that yes, it is more expensive, but only because people are living longer. And so if you're looking at overall, we have a lot of support to help patients Make sure that they can get the treatments that are optimal for them. Sometimes we are not as successful as we would like, and we actually have a donor who helps us out in those circumstances. Yes? Lots of times um, patients with pancreatic cancer learn too late. Yes. Do you think in the future there will ever be a test, blood test, something that um, can prove? can predict, can, can save them? So that particular test that I told you about in the past out is very useful in pancreatic cancer. It's not detecting all of them, but about 80% of them are being found at an early stage based on very early data. But if that continues in the larger study, that's going to be striking. If we find pancreatic cancer early and do surgery, the cure rate is actually very good. And I said, it's hard to say this, but when that surgery was just starting, that was some of the things I was doing. I'm surgically trained. Nowadays, it's done much as a routine, but that was just the first time we were starting. It does work if we find it early, and that's why that study is so important. I'm not sure we're going to be able to find pancreatic cancer early, but that is the holy grail. That's the name of the company, and we have to do it. 
and I were getting better. And even with advanced pancreatic cancer, we're getting better. Um, six years ago, a drug was approved at two weeks improved survival. That was ridiculous. But the last drug approval was threefold improvement in survival. Even in pancreatic cancer, we're starting to get the fulcrum and lever. If you remember back in high school, if I had a fulcrum and level or lever, I'll move the earth. Gotta have that, and we're beginning to get that even in pancreatic cancer. I'm excited about the future. We're not there yet. Okay. Popcorn is popped. I'm, oh, please. So, just to clarify this study that is just for anybody who's interested in being a part of it, you don't, as a, you don't have to have cancer, but it's just the way those masks start. Absolutely. This is to ask whether this test, well, this test in a pilot study done at, in multiple different centers was very useful. But that was done on retrospective samples, samples we had kept in the fridge and it looked really good and I've had many of those tests in my lifetime. I even started a company with an early diagnostic test. By the way, the test worked, the finances didn't. And so, um, this really does look very promising, but they're doing this right. Four different major universities are going to collect samples from across the United States prospectively. Meaning if we don't know whether somebody has cancer or not, that the person we want to deal with, and then ask, do we find it or not, based on what happens to that patient over time, or person over time. So it, it does look promising. I, I'm an optimistic skeptic. Yes? Is there a tool for a person? Is there a person? That particular study, at, to my knowledge, is open to anyone over the age of, I think it's 55. And that's because cancer is a disease as people are getting older. Um, about one third will be low risk, so you have no family history, no smoking history. The others will be high risk, just to increase the chance that we'll have enough positives to make sense out of it. So no, I think that it's completely open to anyone at any age. So you can talk about the virus. Would you folks can talk to them afterwards if you have more questions? Yeah? Okay. Um, so I'm going to apologize a little bit because right now the news is not great. I hope I told you about optimism for the future. We're going to try and give you some realism and then there are some neat things that we need to consider. So Johns Hopkins University keeps track of every case every day and updates it about every hour. This is 4.30 this afternoon. So that's as updated as it's going to be. Okay. The summary is that there's 118,000 people who have been infected and the virus detected already. In the United States, there's 959 cases this afternoon. I expect it's 1,000 by more. There have been 29 deaths, but what is important that we need to pay attention to is that's March 10th. March 17th, there were 164 documented cases. This is going up at a slope like this. I'll show you that in a moment. Right now, there's 54 cases in Oregon, so that means in the population, the chance that you're close to anyone who's been infected is minimal. In the next two or three weeks, that's not going to be the case from at least what we're expecting about this virus. The death rate, I think you've probably heard in the news, people have been talking about somewhere between 1 and 3 percent. That's the death rate of those that have major symptoms. And I'll talk about why that may not be right. Because many people, we think, have contact with the virus develop a little bit of a runny nose and that's it. They never know they were infected. And so it's an overall number. So I think it's going to drop when we get the number, but that's still high. But I do want to start off and say that there is some good news coming. Now this is something that I don't understand. So that curve at the top in orange are, is China. And the numbers went up massively and rapidly in China and then plateaued. And while there is the argument that people were quarantined, it just doesn't make sense. 
The quarantine that they did was of 150 million people. That's an awful lot of people to quarantine, but they weren't protected. Something else happened. This disease burned itself out of the population, and we don't know what happened. Now, whether this is real reporting or fake news from China, we are very worried about that. But uh, they had this somewhat under control, so there is some optimism to think about. Now, that yellow curve, which is every place but China, looks like China's curve a month ago. Hopefully, we're going to see that peak and then start to flatten out. And that's what has people excited. Some more bad news. This is yesterday's list of patients. We have the first column, the total cases, new cases in one day in China, with 3 million, 2 million people, 26 new cases. Incredible. But we look at Italy, Iran, South Korea, France, Spain, Germany, United States, 118 new cases yesterday alone. So this means we have to start doing things about this. So we need to know a little bit about the disease, and I'm going to talk even more about what we should be doing as individuals in Oregon. And one of the things that we talked about, and I think we need to talk about as a community, is gatherings. Today, and I have thought a lot about whether I was going to say we should cancel this, we converse back and forth. The chance that anybody in this room will have been in contact and could spread today is really extremely low. And if not, we would have canceled this. We wouldn't have put people in danger. Where we're going next week, I think we need to seriously think about any gathering for a group of people. And I was jokingly today, we want to stay a little bit away from people. I think the Japanese bow is probably the best way to say hello right now. So what do we know about this disease compared to the flu? Well, right now, it is a very different disease. So the first thing is, is the flu hits like a train. You're fine one day, and the next day, you wonder if you really want to live. It is now. And it turns out that from the time that you interact with someone with the flu, until you have bad symptoms, and you can sh uh, share that bug around, is zero. It's almost instantly. So by the time that you are infectious and you can transmit it, you are sick. And so if you just simply follow normal precautions of staying home when you're sick, you don't transmit. This virus is a bigger problem. It takes about a week from contact to when you have any symptoms. And those first symptoms for the next week are pretty benign. And in about, the number right now is 86% of patients, that's all they get. They feel a little bit sick, a bit like the flu, not so bad. And then 14% right now get really ill. But that's two weeks in. During that time, you can share the virus with anybody around you. And so people who are not showing any symptoms can, can spread. And that's where we're having challenges. Now, the good news, and I promise there would be some, your grandchildren are completely fine. There has yet to be a case of anyone under seven anywhere die of this disease. And I'll show you numbers for other ages. Pregnant women have no worry. There's no evidence this can be transmitted to the fetus. And further, when the children are born, it's not transmitted anyways, they're fine. This is not the flu, where the very young and the very old are a problem. This is not a disease that is really having an impact on children. They might get sick, but they're not getting really sick. For very severe cases, we already have a treatment that's in trial. It's an antiviral agent. We're seeing what happens. We don't know. Vaccines, you may have heard about, there are none, and the earliest possible vaccine. And I don't care what anybody is telling you, if you look at the process, it's a year from now. Probably 18 months. So the chance that all of us at some point in time will come into contact with this disease are important. Now, there is something that we really do need to pay attention to, and it's those people who get really sick, and we need to put an active program in place to help any of our colleagues and friends who are in that group. First thing is, it's a bit like cancer. This is a disease of the elderly. But even there, 
It's only people who have a, another disease. That could be diabetes, lung problems, cardiac problems that are going to be a major problem. If you or you know someone in that group, they should stay home. They should not go shopping. They should not go anywhere. People should deliver food to them and take care of them. That's the group that we want to sort of reverse isolate, keep them away from infection if we can. And if we look at, at no pre-existing conditions in 80-year-olds, and I think you've all heard that this is a real problem, they still do well. It's a combination of age and pre-existing condition, stay away. And we need to make sure that if we, as I said, if we have family members, it's our responsibility to help them. I think you can see that from the back, but it really is neat in that square, up to 50 years old. It's not really a big problem. It's no worse. It's actually better than the flu in that age group in terms of major complications. So when you get to my age group, and I think some of the other of us in the room, that are going to have to make sure that we take more precautions. So what are those precautions? Well, the first one is, is to talk about our masks. Masks do not help in any substantial degree to protect you if you don't have a disease. It does one thing that's really weird. One of the things you don't want to do is to touch your mouth, nose, eyes, with your hands that might have been in contact with a virus. You wash frequently to try and take care of that. I was washing my hands as much as I was when I was doing surgery. But you have a mask on and you're going to be a little more conscious. That's it. It's just consciousness. Because you breathe around the masks. And this virus will go through almost any mask outside of formal high-end protective gear that people will have in hospitals. The N95 masks help a bit, but only a bit. The other way around, though, if you have the virus, it will stop it from spreading. And the reason it, it stops it is easy. It's, it's blowing on it. When you're breathing in, you pull through the mask. You can't push out through the mask when you're breathing in. It really does work. And so that says a few things. And that is, is uh, wash your hands frequently. Turns out that soap doesn't kill the virus. However, soap will loosen the virus from your hands and then the water will wash it down the sink. So it's a combination. It is 20 full seconds to get a reasonable treatment of your hand. Uh, surgeons scrub for three minutes and your hands start to fall apart after a couple of years. I already mentioned that um, don't want to touch your face or hands. The sanitizers, I won't say don't use them, they're not going to help much. Better nothing. But the fact is, is that you wash them, they're on, they go off, they just don't do as much as we would hope. Not with this virus. Avoid contact with people who are ill. If you are sick, and you know somebody who's sick, they stay home. I'll tell you a little bit about what to do if you are sick in a moment. Cover your mouth, elbow, and that's why we don't hit elbows when we're saying hello to someone. You cough into your elbow, you cough into a tissue, so it's bowing, feet maybe, feet are on the ground, so they're fine. Elbows are not a good way now to say hello. Wherever that came from, that was a funny bit. Okay. If you use a tissue, discard it, do not reuse it, don't carry it around, don't have it in your pocket because it is contaminated. And then you want to disinfect quickly and often. There is 70 to 80 percent alcohol solution, not pure alcohol, not vodka, that's only 20 percent. It might help you feel better, but it will not be the virus. And again, I told you about the face masks. I'm going to tell you a little bit about what to do when you're sick. So here's what you do at home. So most of the cases of this virus are going to be like the flu. You're, you're going, it's going to be slower in onset, and you probably won't feel as sick as you do with the flu. There's no specific antiviral therapy, but you treat it just like the flu. So all of the medicine you take with the flu, the anti-inflammatories are the same things, do not give aspirin to children for the flu. You don't give aspirin to children for this particular drug. It can cause rice syndrome. If you have a sore throat and cough, cough medicine.
medicine, whatever you want, hot shower, humidifier will help. Drink plenty of water, rest, and stay home. Grandma had it right 50 years ago. Stay at home and self-isolate. You should stay at home till at least 24 hours after your symptoms are gone. Now, if you're really not feeling well, you call your doctor. You do not go to your doctor's office. Because that means you're going to contaminate everybody else who is there. You do not go to emergency without calling ahead. So if you're really sick, you've got to do this, but call if you can. And if you can't, that's when you wear a mask. Because you're protecting other people around you. So, avoid any form of transportation after you've recovered for a few days. You know, do not go to school, do not go to work, public areas, any place where you're in a group. If you are really sick, and I mean if you're starting to wheeze, if you're having trouble breathing, and that's the, the main symptoms, call your doctor right then, call the emergency right then, explain what you have, tell them you're coming, and get there with a friend or someone you hope will be okay, and their mask is going to help protect them. Face masks is only protect others, not you. I think I've covered all of this. Oh, wash it. Um, if you have a medical emergency, call 911, but tell them why. If your symptoms worth or get worse, call and go ahead. Cleaning and disinfectant. This is the last slide. What do you do? Well, the best disinfectant that we have today is dilute bleach. 70% alcohol will help, but it's only 70%. And it says at least that's wrong. If you go above 70%, it doesn't work. Now, I like most things, more is better, not with alcohol, and less, as I said, the 10, 15% in vodka won't do anything to this virus. Bleach is the best thing, and it's five cups, one third, uh, five tablespoons, one third of a cup of bleach per gallon, four teaspoons of bleach per cup. Per quarter of water. That's it. If you're going to use uh, take clothing, you put it in the laundry, that'll work just fine because you're loosening the virus, washing it down with the washes that you get. Do not shake it out. Do not do anything with the clothes straight in the laundry because you don't want to spread the virus around. And um, other than that, it should be fine. Again, if you use a cart or you take your laundry to a laundromat, Make sure you wipe down everything in that cart, on your basket, everything else with bleach. Bleach still you can get in the stores, it's not the only disinfectant still available. Okay, that's about what I have to say in terms of this, and that really is probably the summary of, of where we are today. We are just beginning to learn what to do. So. After uh, you, you might have had it, um, it goes away, is, has he built up resistance so you won't get it again? As far as we know, there is no reinfection. Now, I want to be a little careful in, in how I explain that. There could be recontact. So you can have a contact with someone who has the disease and not develop the, the full course. If you then are in contact with another person, you could get exposed a second time. But as far as we know, if you have the disease and recover, then you will not get it again unless you are particularly immunosuppressed on some type of immunosuppressive agent. So it's like the flu. Now the thing with the flu, you don't get the same flu again. There are just many, many strains of the flu. As far as we know, there's only one COVID-19 virus that isn't mutating, it isn't changing, it's not adapting rapidly, so this should have a one run through, and then we'll see what happens. Okay. Yes, please. Why is it that so many medical people are dying? The people? Yeah. Okay. So I, there was one thing I didn't mention, and I probably should have. The, the question from the back is why is it that that healthcare professionals are really having problems here? That has to do with the dose of exposure. So what we think is happening in those individuals is that because they're dealing with an extremely sick individual or individuals, 
they're getting a massive viral slump. That's different from where you are here, and if somebody is coughing, you may get a little bit, and your system will have time to deal with it. It won't get ramped up slowly. But we think it's the, the healthcare professionals that are having problems are just getting massive loads because of high end contact. And, and this is a real worry in the community, and it's a worry of whether we're going to have enough facilities to manage the cases of people who get sick. Please. I will expect that one of two things is going to happen. I showed you that curve where things went up and flattened out, and we don't close schools. If that curve keeps going up, you're going to see, and actually some states have done this already, you're going to see schools closed, theaters closed, malls closed. There will be no place, and we will ask the churches to close. We will say seriously consider, but the reality is, is that if that curve keeps going up, this is too big a group. Um, and, and that's because of the way the virus is going. 54 cases in the whole state, they can track those individuals, but if that number starts to do this, yes, we will be asking any large groups uh, to happen. Google has told their faculty and their people to say, oh, don't come to work. Multiple companies that I work with have simply said, we're closing the doors, you're not welcome. Required people are there, everybody else stays home. Same thing happened at um, the University of Washington last week. So there's no reason for people to expose themselves if they can avoid it. And I've already put in place with the people who work for me. If you want to stay home and work from there, that's fine with me. I understand. Because they've got to take the bus, some other way to get to work. So the we is in whomever you're associated with, like the United Methodist Church, just in Seattle, is they made those precautions about gatherings of 50, no more than that. Okay. Then we would receive those kinds of notifications from our higher ups, the mothership, I suppose. You will hear it from, I'm sure, from the church as a general point of view. You will also hear it from the Center for Disease Control. You'll hear it from the groups here in, in Oregon. As I said, right now, the risk of this size of gathering is low. Um, but as if those numbers do this, it, 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 we just don't want to expose people if we can avoid it. Yes, Judy. Um, who do we pay? We're paying attention to you, and I'm assuming people are paying attention to the CDC, but there's, there's other sources of information that aren't necessarily accurate. As who should we be listening to? Okay. You know, this is, a, this is a real problem, and I will tell you that, that I'm even a little bit cautious of, of who we listen to. I mean, we now put Mike Pence in, in responsible for a medical problem. Uh, we have Donald Trump told us that he's not going to be tested despite the fact that he was exposed because he feels fine. Everything I told you there says that that's wrong. So the problem is, is who do we listen to? The CDC right now is extremely conservative. I am actually a little surprised that they aren't being more proactive. And I think that they are hoping that that curve that they saw in China is going to happen here, and they're just waiting cautiously. The World Health Organization, same thing. This is a pandemic. They said that we're not going to declare it a pandemic. It is a pandemic by every single rule. The reason they've not done that is there's a series of, of uh, contingencies that happen that we don't, will not benefit from by calling it a But it is spread. We're going to have some challenges with it. As I said, it is hopeful that this could somehow burn itself up and we're going to see over the next few weeks. But I think the CDC, I think that the local um, health agencies are really doing as good a job as they can. China gave us a month by controlling things before this started to spread, we should have been more proactive. But most of what's being done and being recommended, very simple things that I said are not going to change. Yes? So, I, I don't have the details, but apparently Italy is closed. Yes. So, do you, do you believe that that 
that is a necessary step to control the virus, and if it works there, we should do it here? So if it works there, we absolutely should do it here. So that's a simple statement. Um, I'm not sure that it's going to, and it's a wonderful and important experiment. And so Italy has closed, they've asked everybody to stay home, they actually have police cars with, my, with uh, microphones up going down the streets almost as if it was wartime. Stay home, don't leave, there's a curfew. With the idea of seeing if at least they can start to control this. The rate that shows you the numbers was a thousand people yesterday alone in one day. So something has to help that. This is a wonderful experiment to say if that type of control can help. The other is, is that um, some of my colleagues but here in Portland but on the East Coast have been in a meeting in Italy. They are staying home. It's a difference. The first few people who came back said, oh, I don't need to. They are staying home. And not only are they staying home because they want to, but in Maryland, they are required to now by a fairly risk law in place that says you will not contaminate someone else. And so I think we, I, I don't think, well, I don't know if we're going to get to that level. But I do hope that we will, we will see that this is controllable in, in a fairly near future. Yes? You mentioned the other risk factors that put you at high yes. risk for doing this. Is there any evidence, like if you're a person who is very susceptible to getting the flu or getting these viruses, are you more susceptible? Yeah, the, the data right now is a little bit early, and to say anything, what I really was talking about was not when you have some symptoms of flu, this is when you have major problems. And so there's a little difference there. So the chance that you will catch this and maybe feel sick for two or three days like you do with the flu, maybe four or five, it is real. And I think that someone who is more susceptible to infections as a immune system that isn't all that great, that might happen. In the absence of those other diseases that I mentioned and being fairly old, the major difficult problems don't happen. People recover, they usually recover before they need care or extra care. The idea of saying I'm susceptible to the flu so far is not an indicator. Yes? Yeah, I was being a little careful on that because, again, that's early times and the data is not completely clear. The current recommendation is that if you've had the virus and you have no symptoms and no fever for 24 hours, you're probably okay. The formal ruling is, is that you should have two consecutive COVID tests that are negative before you are free to go. It's now been shown that there are people who can continue to shed virus in their stool. We don't know if that is infective or whether it can be a problem, but that does happen after all symptoms are gone, and that is something that's being looked into actively right now. Yes? So, um, from the time you start feeling symptomatic yeah. to when you're actually feeling better or feeling like you're over it, how are we talking about? A week to 10 days. Week to 10 days. Yeah, it, it varies by person and it varies by how sick people are. There are cases, and we do think there are cases where people never know that we're infected. We think that it can be that mild and it can go all the way through to respiratory distress, needing to go into the hospital for a respirator, and unfortunately, in some cases, death. Yes? Can you address uh, transmission on fabric? Does it need to be soaked or sprayed? So fabric should be washed in a, a wash and dryer. But I'm, I'm thinking about uh, you know, the, the bag you take to the grocery store. Um, yeah. I, 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 there, the answer is, is there's not much that you can do that would disinfect that grocery store or when you get home short of throwing it in the washer and dryer. It's a problem. And I'm not saying plastic is better. It's, it's still going to carry the cases. Hmm? Paper bags, same thing. You can't disinfect them. They're probably clean when you get them from the store. 
but it is a worry. Um, and there's only so much one can do. Um, if you're in those risk groups, have your food delivered. There are lots of stores right now that deliver you. don't have to go out and be amongst all the people. I just wouldn't, if you're in those risk groups. Yes? I'm just wondering now, uh, what can happen when we spring break here? Will that help the situation by not as many people being in large spaces? Well, I think that, that if we are smart about how we deal with that, yes. So spring break means the kids aren't in school. And they're not in contact with each other. By the way, think about a bunch of toddlers in school and say, don't touch the other person. <laughs> and even you know, so you're going to have to spread. They don't get sick, but they can't spread. So closing schools, I think it's going to happen anyways. That's my bet. It's not, we don't need to do it yet. But spring break will be great. The problem is you're going to have kids going to surf races because they can't go to the mall. They can't go to the movie. We're going to have to entertain them at home. Plug them into a VCR or something for, for a week and keep them safe. Unlimited screen time. Yes, no limited screen time. And I, I think that, that in that period of time, my expectation is that's the best advice and could be one of the best things that happens. Just keep kids home for a week. We'll see where we are. Okay, so I just want to emphasize I am not an expert. I'm telling you what I have distilled from everything else. Um, I know a fair amount about viruses from my other work, but this is just really almost everything common sense of what you would do if this was the flu and a bad one going around. So be well. Thank you. Spark treatment and all of that. Casey, thank you so much for your story. There's so much she didn't get to share because she is a breast cancer survivor too. And those are some of the things she was going to tell you. So feel free to talk to her, feel free to talk to Gordon. If some of you are particularly interested in the technology they have, tell your doctors to talk to this, this center. Wonderful pen. Thank you for filming tonight. Thank you for your presence. Keep safe. We'll let you know about church walk when we learn more. And if you learn something before we do, by all means, tell us. So we can do worship at home if that's what we do. Thanks for coming out.